All right, welcome to our session on bio, biosecurity and zoonotic diseases. It's part of our Southeast Indiana Animal Science Series. So we are gonna go ahead and get right into it. Feel free to put any questions in the chat today, or if you wanna stop us in the middle of it and, and ask a question, please don't hesitate to do that. And my name is Joe Richards. I'm the Ohio County Extension Educator. I do Ag and 4-H, and we have Cora Carter on here as well who's gonna be talking here in just a few minutes. Um, Britt Copeland is on here, he's watching the chat for us and he'll help with any questions that may come up as well. So next slide. <clears throat> All right, so we're gonna move right on in, biosecurity. So I wanted to give you guys um, some information on biosecurity, what it means and why it's important. So animal biosecurity is the implementation of measures to prevent disease introductions into a healthy population of animals or limit the spread of a disease once it's introduced. So we want to, you guys to go ahead and figure out a biosecurity plan as well. And that's gonna help to prevent an outbreak of diseases carried by both animals and humans. Next slide. So when you think biosecurity, you really wanna think disease prevention. A lot of people think biosecurity, oh, it's because they're dealing with diseases that are already there, but it's really more about disease prevention. And so we just want to talk a little bit about management practices to protect the health of your, your livestock herd um, or your flock, depending on if you have um, cattle or sheep, goats, horses, whatever you might have. I know some of you might have poultry as well. So um, that's really what we're going to try to hit today is talk about these disease prevention and also how to identify some of those situations that might be coming up. So next slide. So one of the key things that people probably don't think about doing, or maybe um, the key way to get something into their herd that they wouldn't want, is they don't practice isolation when they get a new animal. So this is probably the most important thing that you can do to protect your herd or your flock, is to make sure that if you buy an animal or you bring an animal into your herd or onto your farm, that you do some careful screening and appropriate testing, and to keep that animal isolated. And you think, well, I've just got them in a pen where they can't touch noses. Well, you also need to think about when you're feeding them, if you're sharing the same, you know, water areas, the, the same water buckets, same feed buckets, um, or even the same air where they could be breathing. Um, you want to make sure that they are completely isolated from your herd. And you want to do that for a minimum of two weeks, but it's more ideal if you can go for a whole month of that isolation just to make sure you can check that new animal see if there's any symptoms that they're carrying, anything like that, um, that you don't want to transfer, transfer over to any of your healthy livestock. So next slide. Also, another part of biosecurity is resistance. And this um, includes you know, your nutrition, your environmental, pharmaceutical, um, all your immunization practices, all of that that's gonna help build the animal's body immune system to help resist the diseases. So, you know, thinking about keeping your animals healthy with their nutrition, keeping them at their ideal body condition scores, think about the environment that they're there, um, making sure that everything's clean and taken care of, all of the, um, you know, manure and things that is moved accordingly and keeping them in a, a good rotation with your immunization and, and working with your local veterinarians to make sure that that is taken care of. Your next slide. Another part is sanitation. And everyone always talks about, oh, I gotta go clean the barn. It's, it's springtime, gotta get those barns cleaned out. But it's more than just removing the manure. It's also taking the time to clean and disinfect and really get rid of any um, parasites that could be there, any of the feces, fecal matter, any of the manure, anything that's in the barn and taking the opportunity to disinfect. Um, there's a lot of different things that you can use as a disinfectant. Uh, we're not going to go through and, and name any of those today. Uh, we just want to make sure that you guys know that that's, that's a key when you're, when you're cleaning out the manure and you're cleaning the barns, that you're making sure that you disinfect as well. And that's not just disinfecting the, the stalls and the pens and the gates and things like that. You also need to do all your feed equipment and sanitize from when you go from barn to barn, or maybe you have separate farms where you're um, traveling back and forth with equipment and moving, you know, maybe the tractor in and out or even your own boots in and out. You wanna make sure that you're sanitizing those as well from farm to farm so you're not carrying 
one thing from one farm to the next. So it's all key things that uh, you know we talk about. And when I when I think about things that are you know you're transferring animals, think about your trailers as well when they're going in and out of your farm, um, going to maybe to the stockyards. You, you never know what's rolling through a, a facility like that. So you want to make sure that you disinfect those trailer wheels as well before you get back to your farm, um, just so you can keep the risk at a minimum. So these are all things that you can do. Um, we're going to go ahead and I'm going to turn it over to Cora because she's going to get into more specific diseases with our next slide, I do believe. Yep. There it is. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> all right. So like Jill said, I am Cora Carter and I'm the um, Ag Natural Resources Extension Educator in Bartholomew County. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about zoonoses. So um, a lot of people have never heard this word before. Zoonotic diseases um, are those that animals can pass to humans and vice versa. So those that humans can give to animals as well. And sometimes we just simply refer to those as zoonoses. Um, they can be mild or severe for either the animal or the human, depending on the disease. Um, and it's important to think about these every time you're handling your animals, whether they appear sick or not, because some animals can carry the disease without showing symptoms of the disease. Um, so that's just something you should always have in mind as you're working with your animals. Um, Prevention of zoonoses is, is the best way to decrease your chances of contracting a zoonotic disease. So um, eliminating the pathogen from the animal reservoir is one of the, these ways. If you have an animal that carries a disease, um, it's tested positive for a specific zoonotic disease, even if they're not showing an illness, it's best to just get rid of that animal because um, if you keep those animals around, you never know when one of them might start showing signs if they can pass it between animals or if it could give it to you and you could have a much more serious reaction than the animal is having. Uh, vaccinating animals, uh, like Jill was saying, one of the best ways to make sure that animals are resistant to diseases is vaccinating them. So there are some zoonotic diseases that you are simply vaccinatable. So you can just get rid of that uh, issue and make that animal resistant to that disease. Treating your clinical cases, if you do have animals that you wanna keep and it's a treatable disease, making sure you catch those early and get them treated. Controlling pests like insects or vermin. There are some diseases that are carried by rats or mice or mosquitoes or flies. And if you can keep those animals down in your facilities, then it's a lot easier to make sure you're not gonna be having some uh, zoonotic diseases plus periodically testing for pathogens. There are some diseases that have more specific steps and we're gonna discuss some of those specific diseases in detail in a few moments. Also, foodborne diseases, which are technically, some of them are zoonotic as well. Um, they can be prevented by good sanitation and hygiene. So I know we've been talking a lot about this past year about making sure everything is clean. Well that's a great way to keep diseases down. Um, make sure you cook all your foods to a safe temperature, you safely wash your vegetables before you eat them, um, and eliminate cross-contamination of foods, and that can really help prevent your foodborne diseases. Water treatment can help control your waterborne diseases. So um, if you don't have water treatment facilities that your water is coming from, whether you use a well water or your animals are drinking out of a stream or a creek or something like that, um, if you're gonna drink it, it really should be boiled and filtered and you really should prevent animals from drinking any water that's contaminated. So if you have any concerns that your well water or your spring water is contaminated, um, there are some water testing labs that can help you know what's in your water. You also wanna eliminate skin contact with the soil if there are some environmental borne diseases that you're concerned with. You should wear gloves and cover your face with a mask to prevent uh, inhaling dust particles because there are some environmentally born diseases that you can avoid that way. Uh, even after touching your apparently healthy animals, if your animal doesn't look sick, you really need to wash your hands. Um, it's a really important and simple way to prevent um, diseases from passing from animals to humans. Children also have less developed immune systems. So if you 
let your kids spend time with your animals. Don't allow them to touch the animal and put their dirty hands in their mouth or to touch the ground near the animals or any surface that the animal is touched without washing their hands first. I'm sure everyone is tired of this mantra by now, but there's no other single better way to prevent zoonoses than by washing your hands after everything you do with an animal or its environment. Um, and now I'm gonna get into just some specific uh, diseases. Uh, some of these are more rare than others and I am by no means going to cross every zoonotic disease that we have uh, that's around the world or here in Indiana, just because there are a lot of them. Um, so this is brucellosis. I don't have pictures for most of these, but um, this one is important because you can get it transmitted by your, the fetus or the placenta, the amniotic fluid. So if you're helping your animals give birth, you should really be wearing gloves so that you can um, prevent from yourself from getting this disease. Because if your animal has brucellosis and you aren't sure that it does or doesn't, then you can catch it by touching any of those um, birth fluids. Uh, there is no treatment for the animal, so uh, if you do have an animal test positive for brucellosis, the best way is to, to get rid of it. Um, you want to make sure you're buying animals that are negative for brucellosis or from farms that have no history of the disease. There is a vaccination for animals um, on brucellosis. Uh, but again, that prevention for humans is wearing gloves uh, when handling births and especially abortion. So if you're cleaning up after an animal that has had an abortion and you're not sure why, or even if you are sure why, you should really wear gloves before you touch that. Your zoonotic influenza. So that's influenza A, which we know as avian flu, swine flu, various H number, N number varieties. Um, some of them can pass between birds to birds, pigs to pigs, some can pass to humans. It's not really common that you can pass, if you do catch a swine flu, to pass it to another human, but the CDC and the World Health Organization are watching that as well. So um, a lot of times wild birds are carrying that avian flu without showing any signs of illness. So if you do have domestic birds, poultry, uh, you wanna make sure that they're not you're not allowing wild birds to get in to where the domestic birds are because they can catch the disease from those wild birds um, and we don't have any way of controlling whether wild birds are sick or not. Uh, and if you do have an avian flu problem, there's gonna be some serious depopulation. Um, there's gonna be some implications for nearby flocks, other people that have an uh, those animals nearby. So um, just prevent wild birds from accessing your domestic poultry. Um, pigs can actually be susceptible to human influenza, so don't handle animals if you're feeling sick. Um, so that's something we don't always think about. A lot of times we're thinking about whether the animals are gonna give us diseases, but we can actually also give our diseases to the animals as well. So um, when you're feeling sick, it's not a good idea to spend a lot of time with your animals um, if you don't have to. Uh, leptospirosis, a lot of people just call it lepto, that's from rodents. So urine from infected animals, usually rodents, but can be dogs, cattle, horses, other wild animals. Um, that's where dogs are going to have serious issues, cattle are going to have serious issues, and humans can have some mild problems, but it can be serious in some, some cases. Um, the best prevention is vaccination. Uh, and keeping rodents away from your animals feed while they're in housing. So just getting rid of those pests. And as well, um, making sure you're wearing closed toed boots when you're entering standing water. Don't spend time in, in icky water in your, in your barn or your property, preventing your rodents from coming into your home or near your animals. Rabies, I'm sure everyone is familiar with this. Um, your primary hosts are dogs, you have bats, cats, uh, raccoons, there's lots of animals that can catch rabies. Um, it's a deep bite that, that passes this on. Um, in livestock, you're actually, can, livestock can get rabies, which does lead to death for them as well as it does for humans. So 
if you have any thought that you have been bitten by an animal that you're not sure whether it was vaccinated or not, you really should go through the prophylactic treatment for rabies because there is no human treatment. Um, if you maybe got bitten by a, an animal with rabies, you really, really should uh, talk to your doctor about that. Um, but the best way to prevent this is to vaccinate your pets and make sure you keep wild animals away from yourself and from your livestock. Tuberculosis is something I want to talk about. It is the same disease in both humans and animals. Um, humans, cattle, captive and wild cervids, so those are the deer family. Um, you can pass this from person to person in the air, but also to animals. Uh, so there's been some talk lately um, about why bovine tuberculosis is an important issue. There are some wild deer that have been shot um, that have been showing signs of tuberculosis. You can see in that picture there, there's some nodules um, inside their cavity, chest cavity. Um, bovine tuberculosis is transmissible to humans and it's not a naturally occurring disease in the white-tailed deer, but they can be a reservoir. So um, if you know anybody who's doing hunting or if you have cattle and you know that deer pass through your pastures, you should always be on watch for this because it can cause serious problem to your cattle, but you can also catch it as a human as well. So really you should be very careful. It's not very common for you to catch it. I think they said only one person has caught it from uh, harvesting a, a deer that had tuberculosis and they had an injury and they cut themselves and they got blood, something. Um, so there's only one person so far that they know that has happened to, but it's still possible. So you wanna just keep an eye on that as well. Uh, salmonella. So that's what we traditionally, one of the ways you can get food poisoning. Um, many different animals car naturally carry salmonella and it doesn't affect them at all. So the best way to prevent tr um, transmission of this is to just make sure your food is properly cooked, clean and pasteurized and by washing your hands after touching animals, their feces or the environment. Usually not very serious for humans, but some at risk populations have more of a problem with salmonella. Uh, animals can like I said, they carry it naturally and they can have uh, cases where they become clinical, where it injures them. But the best way to prevent that in your animal side is to decrease their stress. So decrease your stocking density, make sure all your food water is clean and not contaminated. Um, and like Jill was saying, quarantine any animals that are coming onto your property, uh, cull any animals that are showing clinical signs. You can vaccinate, um, but probably not necessary. Um, because you can just help make sure that the, the environment is clean and you probably won't have that many problems with salmonella. So I did want to mention um, that there are a lot of other diseases. This is the last slide that I have, but um, there are diseases like ringworm or um, sore mouth that are pretty common diseases that you can catch from animals. Um, that can be avoided by spending less close contact time with your animals, making sure you're washing your hands and staying clean and um, every time you're handling your animals. So does anybody have any questions or Jill, do you have anything else you wanna add? If not, will you please answer the poll questions that we have for you on your screen? And our next Lunch and Learn is gonna be on May 13th and it will be about selecting replacement heifers. And I believe that's our last one in this series, correct? Brit? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, and we do have uh, one question in the chat uh, and it's just typing it right now. Okay, I can't. So we'll just give her a second to type that out. All right. Or you can unmute, um, whichever is easiest for you.
Okay. A friend of mine has started training pack goats as a regimen for parasite control, vaccination, and pasture management. And fecal egg counts are low to zero, but they notice that goats taken out on the trail have a greater egg count than the ones left at the farm. How long should animals be quarantined when they go out and come back from the trail? They go out once or twice a week while training. Jill, do you have any insight into quarantining times for short times out off the farm? I'm not sure that you would want to quarantine um, since they're going out once or twice a week. That's hard to say. Um, you know, you might try to keep them away from the animals that are not going out all the time. If you have a separate paddock or a different facility that you can put them in, um, that might be your best bet. But if you're rotating them, I don't see how you're going to be able to keep keep them from getting into the parasites and into the pasture where the other ones are. Yeah, that's something that we, we didn't really talk about, but if you do take your animals off of your property, like taking them to the county fair or something like that, and even if you bring them back and they were your animals beforehand, if they've left your property, it's, you almost need to treat them like they're new animals and they really should go through a quarantine or a foot bath or whatever treatment that you usually do before you bring them back onto your property because if they've interacted with other animals or other soil or other surfaces, then they could certainly be bringing diseases back to your, to your anim other animals at home. I'm not sure what to do if you're taking animals a couple of times a week off of your property. That seems like a lot and it would be a lot of work to keep those animals separate for two weeks. Um, your fecal egg counts are higher, but I don't know if the animals are showing any more symptoms. Obviously, that's up to you on how you want to how you want to control those. Interesting. Yeah, I think it's a good thing that they are separating them from their pregnant does, and mm -hmm. I don't know if they can continue to do that. I'm not exactly sure how your operation works, but if you have ones that are, they are the ones that are leaving all the time. Um, I would, I would definitely just keep those away from the ones that are staying just, just so you can try to get, you know, a, a good handle on the parasites and the egg counts. Right. And especially those ones that are sensitive right now, like the pregnant ones or any animals that are sick, or something like that, or your young ones, those are all going to be a little bit more susceptible to worm issues. So I would say definitely keep them away from those kind of animals. And then if you want to mix them back together, you should probably go through a quarantining period um, before you do mix them together. Any other questions? All right. That was a great question. That was, that was a good one. All right, well, we're always here. If you need us, you can send us an email. Our emails are there on the screen and I know you can uh, reach out to us through the emails you get from Brit as well. So um, thank you for tuning in today.